Hey AP Advanced Kids, Campbell here. In this video, we're going to look at electric field for charge distributions. And after we go through some helpful hints and tips, then we're going to just look at off axes for lines of charge in this video. Other videos will be on axes for arcs, for discs, plates, you name it. But not this one. All right, so real life is not a point charge, right? How often do you find just one ball of charge? Usually you have a charge rod, right? When we did our little uh, electrostatics activities, we charged rods. Um, and so that's a charge distribution, not a point charge. And so when we deal with charge distributions, it's best to talk, to, talk about them in terms of charge densities. Now, it depends upon what type of charge we have. Uh, if we have something like a sphere, then we would talk about a volume charge density, or that rho is Q divided by V. Now remember, we did that with gravitation not too long ago where we talked about mass, a mass density, which was mass over volume. Well, charge over volume would be the charge density, and we'd use that for something like a sphere. If we had something like a plate or a disc, then we're going to talk about the surface charge density. And that has a sigma as its constant, um, and it's the charge per unit area. And today we're going to be doing some lines of charge. And for a line of charge, which would also would be like a rod or even a ring, we're going to use a linear charge density, lambda, um, which would be the charge per unit length. Now, a couple of tips when you're doing charge densities is first, divide up the charge into small, tiny pieces of charge ds that we're gonna add up. So the contribution to the electric field then is we're gonna add up all of the electric field from all the little charges, which will be dq over four pi e naught r squared, or k dq over r squared. Doesn't matter really what you use. So, the electric field at any point is going to be the sum of all of the little charges from all of the little fields. So we're going to take an integral. And of course, 1 over 4 pi e naught, or k, is a constant. So we're going to pull that out. And we're going to take the integral of dq over r squared with the appropriate limit centered around where we're taking the integral, where we're adding up all that charge. So we'll relate dq to the length if it's a line of charge or an area, if it's a disc or a volume, if it's a sphere, and use the appropriate charge density. So if the linear charge density lambda is Q over L, then dQ, a small amount of charge, would be lambda times dL, or what we'll call dx. I like dx better than dL. If we were uh, doing an arc of charge, then we would have lambda ds, s usually we use what we use for an arc. If we had a plate or a disc, then dq would be sigma times da. And if we had a sphere, we would use dq is equal to rho times dv. So always with electric fields, you gotta look for symmetry. We, if we have vectors, electric field's a vector, so we have to look to see if we have something that's not on x or y axes, we have to split it into x and y components and then add the x's and add the y's. So sometimes you've got to do electric field integrals for x and y components. Sounds like fun. So this video is going to focus on the electric field for a finite line of charge. And it's going to be off axis, some distance y. Uh, from the line of charge. It's called a finite line of charge because it's finite. It is charge Q for length L, so it has a linear charge density of Q, total charge, divided by total length. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just add up little dQ sections here, little dQ, and a little distance dx. And so I'm going to add that up. Each little piece I'm going to add up as I go through my little charge thing here. Um, and if we look here, right, we're gonna have an electric field. If these are positive charges, right, that means the electric field 
is uh, not straight up. It's not on an X or Y axis, which means this is going to have to split into X and Y components. Um, so that means we're going to have to do some sine cosine sort of stuff. Now, if we look at this, if we add things up, right, we have, uh, we have the electric fields, you know, like this. And therefore, the X components of this line are going to equal zero. But the electric field net is going to be then the total contributions in the Y direction, which is going to be the adding up of all the electric fields times the cosine of theta. Now, why did I pick cosine of theta? Well, cosine of theta, if this is theta, right, then this piece here, or uh, maybe this piece here is theta. And so a couple of tips and tricks about this is that we want to replace R, right? Because the electric field is one over four pi E naught DQ over R squared. We wanna replace R in terms of my X distance from the center of, the, of where I am finding the electric field on the axes here, uh, and y, which is the distance, the, lim the distance above my line of charge. Um, and so that means we're gonna want to uh, make a little triangle here for each of our little pieces dx. And so that means that r, a little Pythagorean theorem, is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. We're also gonna to wanna to replace theta in terms of X and Y as well. And so if I, and I kind of butchered over on that side, so uh, we're gonna want the cosine, right? Cause that's the Y component, which is what's all adding up. And so the cosine of theta is going to be that distance Y, which is a constant, divided by the hypotenuse, which is my square root of x squared plus y squared. Yes, now y is a constant, but x is the thing that's changing. So that's what we're gonna be integrating over is dx. So we're also going to replace dq with lambda dx so that we can integrate with regard to x. So we're also going to set limits then that center around the point of interest. So if this is my line of charge, we're going to integrate across this whole thing, which means we're going to go from L negative L over 2 to L over 2. So we want to center our limits. So it's not 0 to L. We want to center our limits uh, around our point of interest, which is around this point right here. All right. Okay, so let's do this. We want to know the electric field for a line of charge that has a total charge of positive Q uh, for length L and at point P, which is a distance Y away from the center of this rod. And so when we look at this, right, we said that the for the electric field, right, it has an X and Y component, and no matter uh, what we do when we add them up, the X components are gonna cancel each other out for each teeny tiny segment of charge, and the Y components are gonna add. So our electric field net is gonna equal the uh, adding up of all of the electric fields times the cosine of theta. And so that means we're gonna take an integral, whoa, an integral, oh, it's sloppy, dq uh, over four pi e naught r squared cosine theta. Now we can't take an integral of this at the moment because what's changing? Well, r is changing, right? If I'm talking about this little piece of charge, I have this distance r. If I'm talking about this little piece of charge, I have this distance r. My cosine theta, right? Each of these thetas are different depending upon which little teeny piece of charge we're adding up. So we need to write everything in terms of one variable. That is why on the last slide, I said that we need to talk about r, the distance away in terms of x and y, x squared, x being the thing that's changing. And so we do a little Pythagorean theorem here for my little uh, triangle uh, for my distance r. And we needed to change the cosine theta in terms of x and y, because again, we need to have stuff in terms of one variable. So our cosine of theta, right, was y over the square root of x squared plus y squared, our hypotenuse. 
And then, of course, we got to get rid of dq and put that in terms of this x, y phenomena, right? And we said that lambda, which is the linear charge density, is the total charge per unit length, which is equivalent to dq over dl, or I'll call it dx, right? So we're going to do an integral of this with respect to x. And now I have all the things that are changing in terms of that. So let's plug that in here. So our net field is going to be the integral of, instead of dq, we're going to put in lambda dx on top here over 4 pi e naught. And instead of r squared, we're going to put in the square root of x, oops, x squared plus y squared squared. Don't forget that part. And instead of cosine theta, we're going to put in y over the square root of x squared plus y squared. All right, so, and y is a constant, remember, so the only thing that's changing now is our x. So, all right, let's take all the constants and pull those out. So my net electric field, lambda is a constant, so we're going to pull that out. y here is a constant as well, so we're going to pull that out. And then we have 4 pi e naught. Now, instead of 1 over 4 pi e naught, we could also have k. So we could, we could call this k lambda y. That is totally fine. All right, and then we're going to take an integral, and uh, the only thing I've left on top is the dx. So I'm just write that as one, and we're going to put the dx over on the side here. Um, and then we have uh, this x squared plus y squared square root squared, right? So that would just be x squared plus y squared times the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that is going to simplify to x squared plus y squared to the three halves dx. And I have to set limits. Limits are great because they're always worth points on AP <laughs> exams. Um, and we always want to integrate over the interval. That, so that's centered here. So uh, as I said before, we're going to do negative L over 2 to L over 2. Now you could actually probably go from 0 to L over 2 and then multiply the whole thing by 2. I think you'll end up with the same exact thing. But I like to center my limits. Um, because, you know, that way I can guarantee that I'm going to get the points that I need. So what is the integral of 1 over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves? Like, what is that? Well, this one you don't have to memorize. If you need to do it, you will be given it on the integral table that you get with the test. Um, and so I have it over here. This is the integral. Here you get the uh, variable um x uh, over a squared which is the constant so in our case that a is the y um and so when i write this again here we got our constants of lambda y over 4 pi e naught the integral of this is going to be x over the constant squared which is our y squared times the quantity or times this, I'm going to put the quantity, the square root of, I don't know why I'm putting this in parentheses, uh, y squared plus x squared. Uh, and then we're going to do that across our limits, which is negative L over 2 to L over 2. Okay, now before I do the whole limits thing, one thing I can see right now is that y squared is a constant, right? So, you know, we can pull that baby out. And when I pull that baby out, I actually can cancel out that. Uh, x, we can't do that, right? X is our variable. That's where our L over 2 is going to go. So we have that our net electric field is equal to y, sorry, lambda over 4 pi e naught y. And then when I put my limits in here for x, we're going to put L over 2. And then we have our uh, square root of y squared plus x squared. So we got to put in our L over 2 there. So that's going to be uh, L squared over 4. And then we're going to subtract a negative. So that's like adding. Uh, and we have, again, our L over 2 and the square root of Y squared plus L squared over 4. 
And then we just got to simplify, right? When we add, these are the same things, right? So we add them up so we get two of them. And when we get two of them, that means the two on the bottom is going to cancel. And I'm starting to run out of room here. Um, so I, it may look like I skipped some steps here. But so this two, when I add these together, right, we get 2L. And so the two on the bottom is going to cancel. So we're going to have lambda L over 4 pi E naught Y square root of Y squared plus L squared over 4. <laughs> Can you see that? There we go. Okay, now just want to draw your attention to the top. The top of this problem says, it doesn't say that we have lambda. We did put lambda in because we needed to integrate this in terms of x. It says we have a total charge Q for length L. So that means I'm going to have to go in here. So that's not my final answer because lambda is not a given constant. So I'm going to have to replace that by, instead of putting in lambda, we're going to have to put in Q over L. And then we still have that all on top. So guess what's going to cancel? Then we have our 4 pi E naught Y square root of Y squared, 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 please work, squared plus uh, L over L squared over 4. We can get rid of that L. And then we have uh, this in the final answer form. Got rid of the L's, but I'm running out of room, so I'm not going to rewrite that. Now, one more thing I want to say is um, because 1 over 4 pi E naught is the constant they use on your equation sheet, um, but K, Coulomb's constant, not kinetic energy, not spring constant, uh, it, Coulomb's constant is also equal to 1 over 4 pi E naught, you could actually also write this as K q over y square root of y squared plus l squared over 4. So that would be another uh, acceptable answer in this case. It's a lot cleaner looking. I like it better, but uh, I don't know. When we get into capacitors, the 1 over 4 pi e naught will be handy dandy, but um, so it's up to you. You choose. This process is the same anytime we're doing an off-axis line of charge. The only thing that may differ, so like I think there's a problem in your book where instead of like Q for a length L, it's like Q for a length 2A, in which case uh, your limits would go from like negative A to A, um, and your lambda would be Q over 2A. So it's just L may be a little different, so you set your limits different, but this is the process for an off-axis finite line of charge. All right, one more thing about this equation for an on-axis line of charge. So here's our equation again. I put the K in just because it's cleaner. What about if Y approached infinity? So what if, what if the place of interest was super far away from our finite line of charge? So if Y approaches infinity... That means that y is much, 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 much greater than l. And so if we did that, that means that this would be teeny tiny and, and insignificant. And so then notice that the electric field would be kq over y. The square root of y squared would be y, and that would be y squared, which looks just like our point charge electric field. So pretty interesting, huh? So when you're super far away from a line of charge, it just, the electric field is just like a point charge. What about the case that L approaches infinity? So if L approaches infinity, then L is much, 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 much bigger than Y. And so if we look at that then, then this term under the square root like goes away and the L squared over 4, uh, that's a 4, it looks kind of more like a Y, uh, becomes a more significant term. And so we take the square root of that. So we have our KQ, uh, we have our Y down here, and then the uh, that comes out. 
Uh, and we have L. And then the square root of 4 is 2. So we have 2. And of course, this is teeny tiny, so I guess that goes away too. Um, so we have 2kq over L. Hmm. Interesting. Just, just some, some thoughts. All right. That's enough for off-axis lines of charge. So hope you enjoyed the video. You might want to practice this a couple times.